Before there was Quabbin, there was Wachusett. In 1897, the Nashua River above the town of Clinton, Mass, was impounded by the Wachusett Dam. 4,380 acres were flooded in the towns of Boylston, West Boylston, Clinton, and Sterling. This was the first time that the state would flood an inhabited area to create a drinking water supply. Work was completed in 1905 and the reservoir first filled in May of 1908. At the time of construction, the Wachusett Reservoir was the largest public water supply reservoir in the world, and today it is the second largest body of water in Massachusetts, behind, of course, the Cotton Reservoir. Uh, which is so much bigger. Our speaker today is Catherine Parent, Program Coordinator, Department of the Conservation Resources Division of Water Supply Protection. That's the longest title that I've heard recently. <laughs> Catherine has worked for the Department of Conservation for over 15 years, working in such places as Purgatory and Chasm, the Blackstone River, and Canal Heritage State Park. Catherine became dedicated to water education while telling the river recovery story of the Blackstone River, the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. And this is all wonderfully familiar territory to me because I used to live in the Worcester area, so I'm really thrilled to have Catherine here and to hear the story of what she said. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. So happy to be here today and talk about water. So yes, I did used to work along the Blackstone River, and I'm so happy today to, to work and deal with uh, water quality and quality water that is our um, drinking water. <coughs> so I am stationed at Wachusett Reservoir. So the Division of Water Supply Protection manages and protects the drinking water supply for over 3.1 million. Uh, we manage Quabbin, Wachusett, and Sudbury Reservoirs, and the rare Wea River Watershed in cooperation with the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority and WRA. So the Division of Water Supply Protection is responsible for the safe storage of source waters, protection of water quality, and management of the watersheds, while MWRA is responsible for the drinking water distribution and treatment. So here is a map of the whole um, MWRA water system. You can see, um, so most of this water is going um, towards metropolitan Boston, but today we have, uh, there's 53 customer communities. And you can see uh, Wachusett's role here is right in the middle. And then as we look west, we have the largest body of water, um, Kauai Reservoir. But also what I want you to notice is the amount of green area in that space. So the reservoirs are filled naturally with snow melt and rainfall that comes down a hill and fills the reservoirs. But what's happening here in these green spaces, it's all protected. So the water is getting forest filtered, naturally filtered and clean uh, as it fills the reservoir. About 85% of the watershed lands that surround the reservoirs are covered in forests and wetlands, and about 75% of that total watershed land cannot be built off. That's what we mean by protected watersheds. The undeveloped watersheds help keep the water clean, and the streams and reservoirs are tested often by a DCR staff. Because they're well protected, the reservoirs are considered to be very high quality, and it does not have to go through the expensive filtering process. So we still have um, unfiltered or forest filtered water supply. So uh, through this, we'll talk about the water question that keeps coming up. Do, do we have the right to clean water? Who's responsible for, for giving uh, individuals clean water? And so we're going to go back to the city of Boston when it was first settled. 
Uh, the first source of drinking water was a spring near Boston Common. They had, uh, it was like a, a cistern, system of underground storage tanks were used for the water supply. So that would be kind of where near Ben Hall was sitting. Nothing more than a well, water quality kind of poor, and the uh, supply became inadequate. So with the greater dissatisfaction of how this, how clean this water was, what it tasted like, it started the trend of finding upland sources. The solution by 1796 was found by bringing water from the nearby Jamaica pond using wooden logs for an aqueduct. <laughs> <laughs> Jamaica pond in Roxbury was uh, tapped to bring water to Boston. Uh, the pond was located at the top of a hill. Okay, so we're using gravity to deliver water to lower areas. But because of this, not everybody had access to it. So um, Beacon Hill and the North End were not served, so it wasn't pumped up. Jamaica Pond was, uh, was considered the best quality water. It was only sold to people who could afford it but live near the city. So that, again, is the water question. Who's the best to deliver water to the people? Is it the city or a private enterprise to supply water? Here we have Jamaica Pond, we have the wooden um, hollow pine logs. It's still not enough to meet the growing demand. It only supplied about 50,000 gallons a day. So if you look at the population of the time, that would probably be per person, uh, less than three gallons a day. So here's a close up of the aqueduct log. Uh, you can imagine not only was the source not enough water, but there would probably be some leaks, right? Some, some waste here. By the 1820s, the city realized how diseased the water system had become and how necessary water sanitation was needed. These wood pipes leaked. So by 1848, Boston's population increased to 180,000 and Lake Chichuan was the first public water supply. So after decades of dealing with the water question, in 1848, a municipal water system was made available to the public using Long Pond, which today we call Lake Cochituate, in Natick, Wayland, Wayland, and Framingham. So this map is from MWRA, and it shows the distribution and areas. Cochituate Reservoir and the so the construction was a little bit better with metal and cast iron pipes, more reservoirs, this water was to serve everyone. It was more affordable and available to all parts of the city and surrounding areas. So we're getting better. So that's cause for celebration. This here is the Boston Common water celebration, um, the first public water supply quite a gathering, a nice parade, water uh, fountain shooting up in the air. Uh, it was a great day. Uh, let's see, a hundred gun salute, a parade through the city, Mayor Quincy gave a speech, uh, we had, there was an extra poem that was read, when the water was turned on, the fountain leaped 80 feet in the air, so it, a parade, um, some people compare it to like the Patriots one, what, what the, the celebration would be like in, in Boston. So that was a wonderful day. The pictures commemorating the Constitution. Yeah, uh, there's a quote here from Shakespeare there'll be a world, there'll be a world of watershed up on that big arch. Okay, it continues. By 1870, Boston's population had risen to 250,000. Lake Cochituate could not keep up 
with the demand. Uh, Boston's water supply actually became kind of uh, not only inadequate, but not really clean. Uh, the invention of indoor plumbing, nobody really thought about that, right, until it happened. The in invention of indoor plumbing that increased the demand of water. So when you're, when you're turning on the faucet, flushing toilets, using way more water than um, before. Until the 1840s, indoor plumbing only existed in rich people's homes. Um, for an example, in 1829, uh, Isaiah Rogers, he built water, water closets in the hotel, Tremont Hotel in Boston. It was the first hotel to have indoor plumbing. So that kind of kicked off the indoor plumbing uh, trend for those that could afford it. So uh, let's go forward to 1869. The Cotituate Water Board was forced to contract with the city of Charleston for an additional water supply from uh, Mystic Lakes because it was a drought. So we had inadequate water we had a drought, 1870, 1871, and there was an unusual drawing down of Lake Petition, which was devastating because in 1872, there was the uh, Great Fire in Boston, which destroyed 63 acres, including the city's downtown. Undersized pipes, low pressures, hindered the firefighters, um, so, Many improvements happened after this, and the water board hastily, quickly constructed temporary works that linked the Sudbury River to Lake Pichichua. In April 1872, the Sudbury River Act authorized use of the river as a water source for Boston. And by 1873, the engineer's report outlined the detail of the system of storage reservoirs, conduits, chambers, that would create, uh, would add to Boston's additional supply. So let's take a look at that. So that was a system of seven reservoirs along the Sudbury River. Foss, Brackett, and Stearns, and some of you might recognize these names as state parks today. They're no longer drinking water supplies, but they are now um, state parks that you can go and recreate Ashland, Hopkinton, Whitehall. So this continued the use of gravity systems to bring water to distant sources. It had been proven, and it continued with the, uh, it had been proven with the Cotituate Works, and so it continued with the Sudbury. In 1871, the Cotituate Water Board retained a civil engineer, his name was Joseph Davis, who worked on designs for Boston's sewer system. So now we're getting into um, water and germ theory and separating sewer, making sure that the uh, water quality is high quality. So they investigated potential sources for an additional supply, knowing Boston is just going to keep growing. We're going to eventually have this problem again. The water question is going to keep coming up. So they're looking within a five, 50 mile radius for uh, new sources of they felt that the Sudbury water wasn't always the highest quality, but the engineer Davis ameliorated it with having large settling basins, filter beds, that would allow natural, natural cleansing of the water by pooling and let heavier uh, debris and pore matter fall to the bottom. Mains and the dams were placed um, higher so that the water could be taken at higher levels to avoid pollution and all the um, impurities would, would settle to the bottom. So here we have a boring machine and doing that, clearing out some of the sediment and making it deeper. Even before the last Sudbury Reservoir was finished, the water supply was becoming inadequate. <laughs> By 1895, Boston's population exploded to 700. Indoor plumbing now, commonplace. Everybody had it. It wasn't only uh, the wealthy. Uh, planners 
always had foreseen this. Um, urbanization of the watersheds made unsatisfactory water. The intrusion of seawater into existing well supplies uh, gave contamination. So really in a hurry here to look for good quality water. Um, the Board of Health conducted an investigation of the questions of sewerage and the water supply, and in particular, the increasing joint use of water courses for sewer. <laughs> I can't even, can you imagine using the same, the same uh, sources? But here we are, uh, 1873, really putting uh, an act into place to make sure that separate um, sewers and water courses um, for domestic. The concern was seen in uh, scientific discoveries of the day, again in germ theory in particular, they were worried about such diseases as typhoid and cholera. So let's go and see what we're going to do about this, the water question. We're going to get clean water that's not contaminated uh, with sewers, which isn't contaminated with seawater. It's up higher so it can be fed by gravity. So what they found in 1895, the Metropolitan Water Board was formed. And that was their mission, find a new source of water. At this time, the Nashua River, Lake Winnipesaukee, Sebago Lake, and the Merrimack River were considered. <laughs> the study completed by the State Board of Health in 1895 recommended the development of a reservoir along the south branch of the Nashua River. And here we are. The Wachusa Dam and Reservoir constructed by the Metropolitan Water Board. And here is the Act of 1895 um, statement. So the three proposed sites under the leadership of Frederick Stearns was the chief engineer of the Metropolitan Water Board and decided that the new water source should be gravity operated and not require filtration. So even today, it does not require filtration. Okay. So these new ideas, the concept of a municipal water supply, historical photo of where the Clinton Dam is now. So this is a before war picture. This is the south branch of the Nashua River in 1895. And this is the engineer, chief engineer himself. The south branch of the Nashua River is by far the best source from which an additional water supply, because it will furnish by gravity, with the least delay and the least cost, okay, so quickly, inexpensive, very large quality of pure water. It's capable of being supplemented from time to time from other sources, which will furnish a practically unlimited supply of pure water at a comparatively small cost. Uh, opinion, <laughs> small cost, but how, what's the value of water, right? And this was 1895, and where do you think that supplementary water was coming from? So even back then, it wasn't an afterthought, it was a forethought. That the valley of the Nashua, that's uh, the Nashua River, this is where the Wachusa Reservoir would be, would settle forever the future water <laughs> policy of the district for a comparatively inexpensive conduit can be constructed to the valley of the Ware River and beyond the Ware River to the Swift. And that's not enough. Keep going west. Westfield and Deerfield. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to happen. But it was there. It was it was uh, the Mass Board of Health, 1895. They they it was a forethought. If watches it wasn't enough, then here they go. They can uh, go west to the Ware River and Swift. So here we are. 
Wachusett Reservoir. At the time of construction, it was the largest man-made water supply in the world. I'm pretty flat, proud of that. It flooded sections. No, it's different than Quaven, where the whole towns weren't taken. These are sections of Boylston, West Boylston, Sterling, and Clinton. Okay. I am going to, I can get my mouse back, I'm going to show you a little five minute video, break it up a little bit so we can kind of stretch. This is going to give you an overview of specifically Wachusett Reservoir, just five minutes or so, and then we'll come back and we'll get more into detail on little stories of the construction. Wachusett Reservoir, Wachusett along Reservoir, with Wabin Reservoir, Wabin provides an unfiltered an source unfiltered of high quality of water for the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority water, water, water Supply System. Managed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Wachusett Reservoir covers 108 square miles with 37 miles of shoreline and holds 65 billion gallons of water to provide drinking water to 3 million people. That's about 40% of, of people living in Massachusetts. Consider while nearly Consider 70% while nearly of the world is covered by water, is covered by water only 3% of, of it is fresh. The rest is salt water and ocean beans. Just 1% of, of our fresh water is easily accessible with much of it trapped in ice, glaciers, and snowfields. Have you ever needed to wonder where your next drink would come from? Or if you have enough clean water to wash your hands? Or put out fire? Or put out fire? Well, about 125 years ago, people here in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Boston area, were worried about all of them. There wasn't enough fresh water for the population. The first public the first water supply public was water a cause for celebration. Cause for celebration. When, the water, when the water turned on, it, turned it turned found on, 80, 80 feet in the air, followed, by a, followed by a parade. It took two and a half hours to pass a given point. By 1892, the increase was about 50 feet. 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 Shows the rocky hill shows the rocky down on the National River, river. The National winding, river. Its, way winding the its way through the valley. The same view in 1916. The valley is flooded with the waters that filled up that filled Wachusett, up reservoir. Wachusett Reservoir. At the time of construction, the time of construction Wachusett, Wachusett, Wachusett Reservoir was the reservoir largest was construction, the project, construction project, in the world. project in the world. It remains a it great remains engineering a great engineering one of the few unfiltered water, water, supplies, water supplies, in the supplies in the country. Parts of the towns Parts of, of Clinton, the towns of West Boylston, Boylston, and Sterling were flooded. Sterling were Hundreds flooded. of homes, Hundreds six of homes, mills, eight, eight schoolhouses, eight four churches, two, four churches, two cemeteries, two cemeteries and nearly 30 and miles of roads and rail lines and rail were removed were remo or relocated. Or relocated. Wachusett Dam was constructed to hold back the water of the south branch of the Nashua River. It maintains the honor of being the largest hand-built gravity dam in the world. Constructed of granite masonry, the dam stretches 944 feet across. The height of the dam is 115 feet above the ground, with also 112 feet below the ground that we can't see. Excavation, Excavation of the dam began in the October began of 1900, of 1900 and, construction and construction continued for five continued years. Materials brought in by the cable system suspended across, system across, across the valley from towers, the valley that, from towers that moved along tracks. Laborers worked primarily with hand tools.
Earthwork preparing the upper edges of the reservoir floor continued for another two years after completion of the dam. Here you see the construction of the dam in 1904. Behind the dam, the reservoir is starting to flood in the background, and the construction of the fountain that discharges water to the National River in the front. This is what the fountain looks like today. At full, capacity, At full capacity, the water spills the over water or sheds over down or the spillway and enters the, the, enters the Nashua River below. Depending on the amount of rainfall, season and weather, season and the amount weather, of water the amount of the spillway can change. Spillway can change. This, was taken in this was taken in December, and here is the same spillway, the same spillway in, June. in June. With the low water, you With the can low see water, how the rocks were cut to mimic a natural river landscape. Today, the reservoir is filled by rainfall, snow melt, the Quinnipoxit River, the Stillwater River, and periodically by aqueduct from the larger Robin Reservoir, which was built 20 miles away in the 1930s when demand for supply of drinking water outgrew Washusset Reservoir. The north and south north dikes and south are dams dikes made are up dams of earth and stone to fortify the shoreline. The shore These areas are These suitable areas for grassland habitat grass and are critical and for a variety of wildlife species of wild that depends, species on, open that land. depends on open land. Bobolinks nest in the tall grasses of the north dike. The north dike. They're known for their They're unique known for light their unique and hovering. Light up above the grass. Up above the grass. Eastern meadowlarks Eastern show off their black V-necks from posts or taller plants. Or taller plants. The American kestrel the American is a small falcon, is a small also falcon, known as a sparrow as a sparrow. It hunts for prey it hunts over grassy for prey areas. Over grassy areas. An actively growing, actively diverse, multi-age forest multi surrounds, forest the, reservoir. surrounds the, reservoir. the reservoir. This regulates this stream flow, stream maintains flow, water quality, maintains water and, prevents quality erosion. and prevents erosion. This pristine, this pristine environment protecting has provided a great habitat a great for the bald habitat eagles, to to eagles to return. Sometimes a moose, Sometimes will, make a moose will make an appearance. Moose have also returned have also to, this returned diverse to this diverse forest. Common loons Common choose loons the reservoir choose as the their breeding as and, their nesting breeding ground. and nesting ground. Not only does Washington Reservoir provide, clean, provide drinking water, clean drinking water, but the watershed, but the watershed, also, watershed also provides habitat for a diverse, for a diverse amount, of wildlife, amount of, wildlife of wildlife species. Thank you for joining this Thank virtual you for joining tour this virtual of Wachusett Reservoir. Wachusett Reservoir. I hope it's made you I curious made you of where curious your water where comes your from, water comes and, from. What you can do and what you can to do to conserve water conserve for the water future. For the future. Yes, 
absolutely, there was. Like, how would you feel, right? Uh, they really didn't have a choice. It was the first time the state took land from uh, people living and working on it uh, for a water supply. Um, and they were paid, but um, I don't think it was fun, <laughs> right? And I have a couple of quotes uh, in, the, in the next slides coming up so you can get a, a window on what people were thinking. Um, so we have the historical photos, this is how we know what was going on, and we also have the land survey. So that's a natural river originally um, here, and the land surveys were carefully uh, kept and the photographers took pictures of every home that was removed. And not only that, but it was categorized by what angle. You see the, the numbers are the numbers of the photos, and the arrows are the angles of where the photographer was standing. So this gives us wonderful information to find out such things as, it's not the alignment. So we can uh, check the land surveys and the angles of the photographs and we can see, oh, that was uh, Cunningham's pavilion. He had a dance hall up on the hill and the Nashua River went winding down below the hill. Uh, it must have been a beautiful place. So we've got these wonderful photos showing the pavilion. All the trees removed, right? We want clean water. We don't want things um, decaying in the water. So all the trees were removed and the topsoil, right down to the sand, bedrock, clay. Uh, and here's an example of like why I don't like colorizing photos. This is the inside of the of the dance hall, and you can see on the wall. There's like a score, somebody scratched like score, <laughs> maybe a game uh, score or something. But when you uh, see these photos online, you can really enlarge it, just get right into that detail. And here is the same pavilion. You can see the, the river here. And this is not uh, a bridge that was removed. This is a temporary uh, railroad that's going to carry this all this dirt over to build North Dykes. So the natural river was surrounded by hills, right? So it's a, a valley, but on the ends where the dam is, when you fill it up with water, the hills aren't there. So they needed to build earthen dams or dikes um, to prevent it from spilling out. So all of this dirt, uh, Material that was removed from the valley floor was uh, taken to build up those dikes. Okay, and here's to answer a little bit more about your question: like, who, who are these people in their homes, and how do they feel? So this is Persis Andrews, 30-acre parcel of land, um, $3,750 worth in 1898. So her diary, uh, it seems hard for me. I don't like to think about it, but I suppose I'll sh he'll have to do the same as the rest. When I go down to the cellar and see the big stones in the wall, which Father rolled into place with his own hands, it makes me feel sad to think that the house will be destroyed. What can you do? And here's her house. It's beautiful. All right? <laughs> All these houses, it, they were, some were removed and built up again, and some were um, moved in pieces and then brought to different parts of the town. Oh, let me go back here. This is the town of West Boylston, downtown essentially, all underwater. Everything there was cleared out and removed. Uh, 1896, New England Magazine uh, did an interview with a homeowner, his store will be 60 feet below the surface of the water. And he said, my store here uh, has been in our family right where it is for 50 years. It's got to go, so it does my home. My relatives live all about me, and they and theirs must all go too. It's hard. 
The state pays us, most people think, very well, but it can't pay for heartbreak. Mm -hmm. So that is a little insight of the feeling of the day. You know, I'm sure some people probably enjoy the, the payment, but still, it's um, so, to build this dam, they had to find a site, and there's some interesting uh, things going on here. We have some boring machines, sufficient borings of the river have been made. This is in uh, 1896. They had to find the actual site to place the dam. They had to analyze the ground uh, to find out what layers were loam and what was, you know, sand. Here's some plans and experiments for the North Dyke. Here's another boring machine. And I'm looking through the annual reports and finding, you know, some, some figures just kind of stick out more than others. But um, in 1896, the um, the total number of borings had an aggregate depth of 17 miles. So they had to do like 387 borings over by where the dam was placed and then 798 borings over at the North Dyke just to check the stability of the soil. Um, it's pretty amazing. So there's a postcard showing the dam site right across the river there. So, uh, boring, finding the location for the dam, but now, um, as we talked, they need, water is needed. So, Sudbury is inadequate. The first thing they want to do is get an aqueduct to, to start getting this water over to the Sudbury Reservoir and keep moving towards Boston. So, the first task, um, before uh, it even was completed, the Sudbury Reservoir was completed, uh, they needed to start working on these things. So simultaneously, the Wachusa Aqueduct was built from the plant to Sudbury, and its completion was in 1898. So here, this picture is showing this big wooden structure is a flume, because down below, where the dam was placed, it, there were Lancaster mills, which were uh, continuing to operate, but they needed water. So um, the flume is bringing some water down to them, and a cofferdam, a temporary cofferdam, is built there so that they can start working um, on that project. So there's the wooden flume the water is going through. You can see the temporary dam there. And then that building there, that is going to be the, the head of the aqueduct. Um, dangerous work. Uh, you see how small the men are in relation to this, what is going to be a tunnel for the aqueduct. Working uh, with blasting apart the stone with dynamite, which is pretty unpredictable very dangerous. Here we have another uh, type of worker. We have the engineers here. They have candles on their hands. <laughs> I don't want to be in a tunnel where they can't die, right? You know? Um, but yeah, these uh, by the tools they have, uh, they seem a little better off, but still quite a dangerous job. Um, we assume those are engineers working on the aqueduct tunnel. Um, here shows how large these tunnel was for the water to go, blasting right through a rock in this place. And then um, other areas, it is cement mining with brick. So inscribed on the back of this photo is multi-race and immigrant laborers. The first concrete and brick work of the whole town. So this is going to relay water to the district through connecting Wachusett to Sudbury. Here we are again, reminding you 
that's the aqueduct, and there it is. Uh, up close, and this is, it's open. So this was the first opening. Of course, all the chief, the chief engineer is there, um, Stearns, and anyone that's important, because this is a monumental thing, because it's opening the water. And this is the terminus at, at Sudbury. So here they, they travel down here. So March 7, 1898. Okay. But work continues. Uh, we need to get the valley ready. So preparing land. They're out there with picks, shovels. Everything's got to go. And remove all structures and trees from the valley. Uh, an exception there on the hill. Same thing that stone building, if you drive through West Boylston. That's the church. Yes. So here they are piling all the, the brush to be burnt. There it is. So that's what we, uh, when you walk, drive by the causeway in West Boylston under 12, 140. That's uh, the old stone church was allowed to stay. So we think of it as a symbol of resilience. The landscape changed all, changed all around it. So this is a photo from 1898. The old stone church was built in 1892. And it was destroyed by fire two years before it was built of stone. So good choice to build it from stone. But just in five years, the Metropolitan Water Board bought the church um, from the Baptist Society for the creation of the reservoir. But because it was uh, made built of stone, it was allowed to stay. Um, all the wood inside, stained glass windows, everything was removed. So you can go see it today. It's a, it's a shell of the building, but it is uh, landmark and not a monument. Why did they remove? They removed anything that would um, that would contaminate the water as it decomposed. So the the church next to it that we don't see standing today is St. Anthony's Catholic Church was removed um, so that the structure wouldn't deteriorate and then uh, contaminate the water. And it was a stone church and it was inside, so... Well, the flow line on the... Let me go back here. So the flow line on the maps depends on how much water we get. So if, the, if there was more water in the reservoir, it would flood inside the church. So the same with these buildings. They were removed because they would be under the uh, high water line. There's stripping of soil there, so not only the trees, but uh, getting the soil in carts and moving them to the north dike. And here's a photo. We've got the church in the back there, too. Uh, they haven't dismantled the wooden church yet, but this is 400 cords of wood um, piled up. So this is March 1902, and church services were allowed to continue for another month after this photo was taken. So they were still using the church as the as the valley floor was being um, cleaned up. Do you know if they sold the wood for firewood? I, I really don't know what they did with the wood. There, there are pictures of them burning brush, right. but there's really, uh, no, I don't have a record of what they did with the wood. Um, and there's where the, the road goes today. You can see the stone church is in the distance. Yeah. The wooden church is dismantled. It's just a, a foundation there. You can kind of still see the foundation poking up through the grass. But this is such a deep, Thomas Basin here is so deep, and it kind of works like how they designed Sudbury Reservoir. It's a, it's a settling basin, so put a Poxet River and Stillwater meet upstream here, and so it's a deep, deep basin that any impurities will sell to the bottom before they enter the reservoir. All right, it's pretty. 
pretty stark to see. So, um, again, the Stillwater Rivers and the Oakdale Rivers uh, brought in a lot of industry to the area. A lot of mills had to be removed. Uh, dams were removed to open the water flow. But it really um, helped to clean up the area. So considerable amount of work was done to clean up uh, around the mill areas to remove waste. Oh, this photo is interesting because you see the, the painted mark on the telephone pole. We believe that this is the high water mark. Oh, wow. So anything under there is under the right. it was removed. Two cemeteries with almost 4,000 graves uh, had to be, the graves had to be removed. So it was a difficult job, but it was done with as much uh, care and respect as possible. So here we have a picture of St. John's Cemetery in Clinton, and they are in the process of removing bodies. Because um, this, this again, assumed to be under the, under the water. We can't have anything decomposing. They did contract Martin Murphy, who was a well-known undertaker uh, at the time, to gain, you know, to have someone uh, that people trusted to make sure this was done as, um, as carefully and thoughtfully as possible. So uh, graves are being removed, a considerable amount of soil. The soil was dug and put into carts and moved away again. Here's a before picture, and here's the new cemetery down the road. We believe that's the same stone there. So where did the soil go? they did that was, as they're digging, they loaded it into carts, brought these carts onto the platforms, dumped the water into these rail cars, and then this temporary... <laughs> oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's the water. That's the water. <laughs> no topsoil, look at that. Yeah. It's down to sand. It's very clean, it's very clear, um, but that's how they did it. Put it on those temporary uh, rails. There's the horses dumping the water into the carts and then bringing them over. Uh, 7.9 million cubic yards of soil. Wow. And here's just uh, another large scale project. This isn't the railroad tunnel or the um, aqueduct, but this is a rock. So this is moving the Central Mass Railroad um, to where it needs to go, even if it means cutting through ledge of rock. So they're blasting through here, very dangerous. This is where accidents would happen, even fatalities doing this type of work. And uh, you can see they're just blasting through there. You see the, the worker up on the top of that hill, which you kind of a scale how big that ledge is. And there it is today, it's it's part of the Central Mass Rail Trail. It's a small section that goes through there and you can walk, you can walk right to the, um, the dam through there. And here is the viaduct. So this is also part of the project of moving because this originally was, uh, the rail was going right through where the middle of the reservoir is going to be so it had to be rerouted over here. Check, I would love to ride on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the viaduct is complete, it's finished at this point, but you can kind of see the fountain's not complete. The dam over here is uh, still working, and the reservoir is starting to fill up. We just have a little bit of water, but eventually, this is all going to be water. 
but you can just kind of see the scale of it. These are those huge um, derricks and cranes. This is just uh, moving in the girder. So when the reservoir is full, the water comes off the spillway and goes back into the, the river here. Um, it, today it looks like a natural river, but it's not. It was, it was hand up to look natural. That's the building of it. And then there's the what we have today. We still have the, the abutments. So this is the tunnel. Whoops. We're gonna take a so yeah. Um, a tiny little light way in there. So this is the tunnel. So on the other side of that impressive bridge was a thousand foot uh, rock tunnel for the train to go through. This is an amazing uh, trip. Um, so news of this engineering feat was heard worldwide, largest construction project going on. The Panama Canal Commission were looking for advice on their construction project and they toured the completed dam site in 1905. And then we have the um, record of the first, the first stone laid at Wachusa Dam. And some people who come to our damn day, they, like this is one of our famous photos, you know, uh, John Mercer here is a mason, and he had the honor of laying the first stone and the last stone. Uh, but you can't see the first stone because they, they had to dig through down through bedrock to find the stable base of where the dam was going to be. So that is way down there. And this diagram gives you an idea of where the ground is. So when you're at the dam, you're standing here. But you don't, you don't know that the amount of dam above you is even bigger below. And that's the little key right there in this whole thing. All right. And then so we just keep going in, in these amazing uh, photographic record of <laughs> the more <laughs> the practices they had here, like, wow, <laughs> you know, this thing, this thing could move around, and it's got cables, and it's pulling these heavy, this, this brick is coming up and going up here, so you can see how dangerous this would be, and where um, accidents and fatalities might have happened, with falling rock. So the granite rubble, the dam is beautiful on the outside with very precisely cut um, ashlar granite, but inside it's kind of just filled with, with rubble. That was in the video, it's just uh, showing, <laughs> I don't know, do you think they were posing for that? Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> There's so many photos where they're just doing these outrageous things tools that they have. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing to get a glimpse of, of a day in the life, uh, but really immense work. They're jumping. And there again is the construction going on as the river is filled as the as the river is being held back. Oh, this, they've got to stop the flume now, so that's what this close-up is. Um, the, the fountain is now bringing water downstream to Lancaster. So this is being put down. Here he is again, looking a little older, but he is older. Uh, now it's 1905. Uh, the first stone was laid in 1901. And just 
just a few words about uh, the laborers and the you know how this was built on the backs of, of these laborers and living in these horrible conditions. This is one of the people who would call a shanty town. They didn't um, have permanent housing, but moved to where the Sometimes working 10 hours a day until the labor laws were changed, and then they got nine hours a day, which is still when you're, when you're digging rock or, or breaking rock. It's not. So we, but we have it. Has it been worth it? What do we have? We have this huge dam, beautiful scenery. You can come, come visit us. These are just all photos of. Day. And then, so this is how we are connected to Quabbin, which you might be more familiar with. The Quabbin Aqueduct um, brings water to the Quinnipoxic River here at the, and then the Quinnipoxic River brings everything into Manchester. That's just it. Okay, let's see if we have. I just wanted to bring this up because I know we talk about this while we're waiting. Um, our rules are a little bit different. <laughs> right. yeah. Our rules are a little bit different um, because the, the goal here is to protect the drinking water supply. And as I mentioned before, it is still uh, unfiltered or, or forest filtered water supply. So um, please come visit us, but pay attention to the signs and things that not be allowed to protect the water supply. And we just have a couple more pictures. Here is uh, bird watching, we the moons, and first day hike, which is a popular event we always have. And that's it. Oh, I would like to, uh, I need to do a shout out to Sean Fisher, our state archivist, um, who with numerous volunteers with Digital Commonwealth, so they're available for us today. Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, and then there is our website there. So thank you for having me today.